Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. That's the deal. Best health. The idea is to try and help you achieve the best health that you can. And the, sh- the topic tonight is menopause. A lot of women feel like they can maintain their health up until menopause, and then they feel like they're occupying somebody else's body or a body that's aging faster than <laughs> the, the speed of a speeding bullet. So we're going to talk about the 10 major and most common issues of menopause and then the natural solutions for them. First, we have to get our nomenclature straight so that you know exactly what menopause is and when you're in it. So a woman is said to be in menopause when she hasn't had her period for a year and when something, a hormone that's made by her anterior pituitary called follicle-stimulating hormone, and the nickname or acronym for it is FSH, when that blood level is consistently elevated to 30 or above, consistently, and that is really the bugaboo. It's consistently because a single FSH level can be misleading. It can go up and it can go down. In the perimenopause, when your estrogens and other hormones, but particularly your estrogens are going up and down, you're at the mercy of these yo-yoing hormones and so is your follicle stimulating hormone. So if you took your blood levels up at one day in perimenopause, it could be elevated and you would think you were in menopause, but then two weeks later, it could be low again. So you need to have sustained Um, non-period for a year, and sustained elevated follicle-stimulating hormone. And also the caveat to know is if a woman is using certain hormone therapies like an IUD contraceptive or oral contraceptives, the FSH test is no longer valid. I don't know how many of you knew that. So if you are going through menopause and having a rough time and you go onto your computer and you Google it, You join the ranks of millions of women who are Googling menopause. It's one of the most commonly Googled, that's now a word in our English language, term, because so many women aren't feeling good when they're going through menopause. They're feeling miserable, and we're going to talk about answers for common problems. And what we're going to address are weight gain. That's one of the biggest bugaboos of all ladies. And it used to be thought that you gained an average of eight pounds. And now if you go to any of the conferences, women are discussing physician, um, female physicians are admitting Guys are still going by the literature saying women gain on the average of eight pounds. Female physicians are saying, hey, let's be really candid here. The average woman now is gaining 20 pounds plus. So weight gain, insomnia, hot flashes, fatigue, brain, mood, cognition, your perception of your world, the new issues, new issues that arise, gut changes, skin changes, Genital urinary changes like leaking and dryness of the vaginal vault, painful uh, intercourse, dyspareunia, and libido has gone south and joint pain. So these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing on this show, trying to give you some really great cutting edge science, and at the same time, not making this too complex while you're taking your walk around the park or hopefully at the gym having some fun combining stretching with weight resistance. So the first thing is weight gain. You know, obesity happens more all over the world to women. And obesity is thought to be caused by an imbalance of eating too much and working and moving too little. But severe obesity is much more prevalent in women than men worldwide. And obesity pathophysiology and what is the underlying issues for it seem to be very related to hormones. So one of the studies I wanted to share with you on this, because I've been saying this for years, if a woman during her menopausal years balances her hormones better, either through dietary and nutritional mechanisms or by bioidentical individual testing and replacement, she tends not to be a victim of gaining those 20 to 30 pounds. Now, some women go on hormones and gain a little bit more weight because in some women, hormones do that, but then you can individualize how a woman takes it. They can take their hormones every few days. You can make sure that the male hormones are better in balance with the female hormones because that might be the issue. Sometimes if you go on estrogen without the testosterone, you're more apt to gain weight. But on the whole, women tend to have more obesity problems all throughout their life And then they tend to have severe obesity problems or weight gain problems when they start to have their hormones go south. 
So a great article that came out in Human Reproductive Update in May 2017 was all about, let's take a look at sex hormones and obesity. It's called Ovarian Hormones and Obesity. And they took a look at all of the data and articles that was published um, in a number of different um, review systems all the way through 2016, taking a look at why is it that women gain more weight? And then why is it that the menopausal woman has the biggest weight issues of all? So the conclusions of these authors discussed, we find that estrogens play a leading role in the causes and consequences of the issues of female obesity. Estrogen tends to act with adipose tissue genes and actually dictates how many of them you have on your body. And it turns out that the more estrogen you have, the less fat cell mass you have, and the more estrogen you have, like in your premenopausal years, the more estrogen control you have over having less fat cell mass. In fact, estrogens also protect against many of the things that are linked along with obesity to put you more at risk of disease called um, metabolic or cardiometabolic syndrome. So menopause reverses the protective action of estrogen. And these authors say menopause reverses women's protective adipose tissue distribution since the more estrogen you have, the less fat cells you have, and the less estrogen you have, the more fat cells you have. Now, we know if you're an athlete and you're working out so much that you lose all your fat cells, um, you stop having a period, and there is this whole sequence of events that occurs with that. But these effects, these authors say, of a menopausal woman being deficient in estrogen and thus losing more control over how much fat wants to stay on her body called adiposity uh, genes. This is reversible with estrogen treatment. With respect to eating, there's even a link. They say increasing estrogen levels progressively decreases your desire to overeat, that in the early stage of your period in the follicular stays, stage in, in um, the premenopausal um, menstruating woman, during the stage of your period where you have more estrogen, you have more control over your appetite. In the second stage, where you have less estrogen and more progesterone, you have less control over your appetite. Now, they, there are studies that are looking at the link between progesterones kind of turning on your appetite a little bit, but they're not as causal of a connection as estrogens, when they're in balance and when they're sufficient in your body, tend to help work with cholecystokinin and other appetite hormones to help you feel like you could push yourself away from the table. So one, estrogen controls the number of fat cells you have, and two, it also controls your satiety and your ability to eat Goldilocks just right. The other things that these authors said is preclinical research indicates that the mechanism for the preambulatory decrease in eating is basically estrogen turns on your satisfaction or your satiety center in your brain. Now, we also have learned that oxytocin in a number of human trials sprayed up the nose, which is the way it is in most academic trials that's given as a nasal spray. There's other routes of delivery, but in the appetite studies, it's been done up the nose because it goes in two seconds. It has activity on the brain and the satiety center. Oxytocin cuts down um, the desire for sugars, the desire for sweet, and the desire for excess caloric intake, and that's been replicated. So estrogen along with oxytocin is really helpful in a menopausal woman for helping her have less fat on her body and having her appetite be under control. And also oxytocin has signals that are delivered to your muscles that keep your muscles stronger and more robust. And that gives you more of a, a metabolic index. So those two are really big winners. Now, as I said, some women, about 15% of women who go on hormone replacement therapy do tend to gain a little weight. And you want to take a look at your male hormones. That's often a suggestion that your estrogen in ratio to your other hormones, and all hormones work as a family, and if one of the other hormones in that family is dysfunctional, just like a human family, it can create havoc with estrogen. 
Now, it's interesting. It says emerging functional brain imaging data indicates that fluctuations in um, ovarian hormones, so especially in the perimenopause when your hormones go up and down and up and down and you're a victim of that as well as your FSH is a victim of that, this really uh, influences your reward pathway, your dopamine pathway, and this also makes you be much more moody and makes you eat out of control, especially makes you feel more stressed and then eat out of control over that stress. But balancing your estrogen and also taking a look at your whole hormone family is very helpful for all these issues. Now, this isn't something that's really talked about a lot in the literature, but um, it's really um, important. And what's interesting, these authors say the wider implication for understanding that estrogens have a lot to do with keeping our body smaller and when they go south as we age, our body seems to be out of control because its control mechanisms um, have been dampened down and this also affects our desire to eat. And this, the conclusion of these authors was the markedly greater obesity burden in women makes understanding the diverse effects of sex steroid hormones on eating, on body adiposity, and on mood, because as we're going to learn soon, hormones have a lot to do with your brain health and your perception of your life. And they said, um, since these are so important, we should really take a look at ovarian hormones in women's obesity and in menopausal years to take a look at using them to help women gain better control over their weight and over their life. Now, when women start to be in menopause, they start to have more aches and pains. They start to feel fatter. They maybe isolate a little bit more. They're not feeling as good and they sit more. The sitting syndrome really starts rearing its ugly head in menopause. And in the Women's Health Initiative, this was a series of studies put on by 40 different prestigious institutions. It was initiated in allegiance with our government because they said, hey, our aging demographic is the fastest growing demographic we have. So what are the particular demands and needs of aging women and how do we protect them as best as we can so we don't we don't have a large number of unwell citizens and we don't also um, strain our Medicare and the systems that we have in place to try and take care of these people. So they ran an observational trial and this was called the Women's Health Initiative Observational Study. And they were looking at women every which way to see what goes wrong and how can we get it right. And they took a look at women and how long they sat. They looked at their physical activity, and then they measured their estrogens, and they measured how well we process or metabolize our estrogens. And um, this study was very interesting because they, their data suggested that prolonged sitting, and that was they had two groups, women who sat more than five hours a day. Five hours, you started seeing some deleterious changes to your estrogens. And at 10 hours a day, you saw very serious changes to your estrogens. And it occurred no matter how much strenuous exercise you did at another time of the day. So you really have to figure out good sitting hygiene. If you're going to be sitting a lot, you've got to figure out a way that breaks that pattern. Um, this, they said that our data suggests that prolonged sitting and lower moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity are associated with higher levels of postmenopausal estrogen metabolites that are in the picture of more hormonally driven diseases like breast cancer. So you're aging, you're making less estrogens, you sit more, and as you sit more, the metabolism of those estrogens, the, the daughters and the granddaughters, the metabolites all have their own activity and the estrogens start being broken down into daughters and granddaughters and metabolites that puts you in a pattern more prone to hormone-driven diseases like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, uterine cancer, and even other diseases, other cancers, um, and so forth. So you have to really fight sitting or you have to have a strategic way that you do sitting. If you just sit up a little bit and tighten your quads, just standing up and sitting down breaks that cycle getting up every half hour, and even having a chair that swivels and moving or kicking your feet so that you're not in a sustained position, which I tend to do when I'm in my radio shows because I'm trying to be right next to the microphone. Another thing of uh, weight, something to consider, is that detox needs to move mainstream with menopausal women to help keep that weight off. 
There was an article that came out this year, February 13th. I was lecturing in Vegas on the 14th, and I saw this article the day it came out, and so I shared it with the audience there. It came out in Plus Medicine the day before Valentine's Day, 2018, and this study was run by my old um, think tank group along with Harvard, taking a look at a group of women who are trying to lose weight and then seeing who, after they lose weight, keeps it off and who doesn't. And they happened to also take a measure of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the body besides monitoring and tracking the weight. In this study, the endocrine disrupting chemicals that they were looking at is a mouthful to pronounce. It's per floral alkyl substances or PFASs, which are basically substances um, that come from nonstick cookware and a variety of other chemicals within our lives. The study was called the Pounds Lost Trial. It was a randomized trial out of Harvard in conjunction uh, with, with Louisiana. And they discovered that the women, when they tested the blood for endocrine disrupting chemicals, the women who had elevated levels of PFAS, so they ate all their food out of nonstick cookware and they used a lot of plastics in their lives, et cetera, they are the ones that no matter what they did, the weight came back on. Because a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals named by Blue Brumberg down in Southern California at UCLA are obesogenic and that they make our fat cells nasty. So one, a lower amount of estrogen is making us be more prone to a larger mass of fat cells. On top of that, our appetite is not as well controlled. And the more chemical burden that we have within those fat cells, the more difficult it is even if you go on a sensible diet and you start taking measures. Some women might go on bioidentical hormone therapy hoping that they will be able to get a handle on their weight. But if they have a lot of body burden of endocrine disrupting compounds, they might not be getting the effects, the desired effects that they would like. So the conclusion of this article was in this diet-induced weight loss trial, um, higher baseline blood levels of PFAS concentrations were associated with greater weight gain, especially in women um, who had larger body mass because many of these endocrine disrupting chemicals, like everybody else, love fat. They're lipophilic and they store in fat. So the more fat cells you have, the more piggy banks of endocrine disrupting compound chemicals that you have. Now, the possible impact of environmental chemicals on the obesity epidemic really deserves attention. And if you're a woman that's battling the bulge and the weight in menopause, you want to consider, besides all the sensible things, I mean, these are things you know, you know, eat good portions, eat less carbs, eat less processed foods and move more. But a lot of people, women do that and aren't getting their bang for their buck. So you might want to consider seeing um, a functional practi practitioner that can measure your hormone levels and individually recommend bioidentical hormones because if you get on estrogen in a balanced way to testosterone and your other hormones, that starts helping you get more signals for smaller massive fat cells. If you have sitting hygiene so you don't have the sitting syndrome that aggravates your estrogens no matter what you do. And you might take a look at how your house and how you move through your life exposes you to endocrine disrupting chemicals. I have a book called Hormone Deception. It is on Amazon. Um, I explain the whole problem of hormone deception. In fact, that book was the reason I got my gig as an estrogen scholar at the Tulane Think Tank. But if Toward the end of the book, I take you on a tour of your house and your office and your supermarket cart to learn all the different things you can focus on to lower your um, body burden of endocrine disrupting compounds. So that's a little comment we want to talk about on weight. And now we want to go to insomnia because difficulty sleeping is one of the other major problems. This happens a lot in gents too. It's not one that's only to women, but Sleeping less. Now, sleeping is so important because it's the time that we reboot 
And the deeper you sleep, the better your immune system works. And the deeper you sleep, the easier it is to keep off weight that we just said you're already starting to battle with when you're you know, entering your menopause and it really accelerates in your sixth decade. Your sixth decade is like entering another planet, especially if you haven't been prepping for it like Iron Woman. Um, you have to prep for each of your decades so that you can move through them with less trauma to yourself. But insomnia is a significant issue for a lot of ladies. And in the literature, they talk about um, or women are prone to use a sleep hypnotic because they're so effective. They're like the old lorazepam and the newer Ambien and Lunesta and things like that. But in much of the replicated literature, for every 30 plus pills of these sleep hypnotics you take, you lose a certain amount of the length of your life. You are at higher risk of premature mortality premature mortality because these are so deleterious to the system. Whatever pill you could take that would knock you out, that cures your insomnia that quickly, it's having a side effect. In fact, there's some discussion of it shortening telomeres and other things like that. But we do know that sleep hypnotics are okay in the short term, but they're not a long-term answer. And now some doctors were saying, well, because sleep hypnotics aren't good for you, we'll just recommend that women take Sudafed. Hey, why don't you do that? Because the antihistamine, anticholinergic meds certainly help you sleep if you don't want to get a prescription. But these are anticholinergic and antihistamines, which do, in fact, many of the major sleep, um, like PM. Tylenol PM, it, it has antihistamines in it. That's the component in it that's added to the Tylenol that helps you sleep. But there's clear literature for every three years that you take on a regular basis, uh, anticholinergic meds, of which there are many of them, and allergy meds are one of them, you have a, a significant increased risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease so many years down the road. And for every three years, it starts elevating 20, 30%. It's very significant. I dated a guy on, on Match.com from San Antonio. He was a neurologist. And he said, boy, all the neurologists in San Antonio, we got the memo. You should never have anybody be on uh, um, allergy meds for insomnia because we know that it's very deleterious to the brain. And here in Austin, our docs for some reason didn't get that because I see a lot of patients who were put on these medications years ago and they're beginning to have a lot of symptoms of cognitive decline. So those aren't the answers to insomnia. Why are you having insomnia? I mean, there's lots of different reasons, but as estrogen levels go up and down, it creates hot flashes. The fall, the rise, the fall of estrogen makes your thermostat go um, crazy and you have hot flashes. Many of the times the hot flashes wake you up. And I'm going to give you, we're going to talk about natural answers for that. There's natural answers, there's food answers, and there's hormone answers. Because if you take hormones, that keeps your hormones more zen, but there's some nutritional answers that keep your hormones more zen. You also can make less melatonin because as you age, the area of the brain that produces melatonin starts getting calcified. And we did cadaver dissection in school. We would look and see people of 55 and older. You could ping with a scalpel um, where... Um, the production, the pineal gland in the cell of Tursica, it would be like a massive calcium and that gland is not secreting any melatonin. If that's not just an issue of elderly people. So this whole thing of a black room and don't look at screens, that's really appropriate for younger people. But most of us as we age aren't making our melatonin anymore. So some people respond really good to melatonin replacement. Um, sleeping is a way of keeping in sync with the planet. It's a way of achieving and enjoying circadian rhythmicity, being in sync with light and dark. So when we're babies, we sleep all the time. When we're young, we can sleep anywhere. We can sleep on, in a chair, under a dining table. We can sleep. And as we get older and older, it gets harder and harder to sleep. And if you're ever in a nursing home or a lockdown dementia unit, there's sundowner syndrome where they usually sleep all day and they're up all night because part of the severe aging and disease process that these people are experiencing puts them completely out of touch with light and dark. So 
If part of your problem is that you have a, a circadian rhythmicity issue, this is often reflected in adrenal dysregulation, and this can be tested and evaluated and then nutritional answers by a 24-hour saliva test taking a look at cortisol or a 24-hour urine test taking a look at all the cortisol in the metabolites, um, but it can be an adrenal issue. And often with adrenal issues, if your adrenal glands are working really, really healthfully, you usually tend to sleep all through the night, even if you think you need to pee. But if you have too much cortisol, which is your awake hormone, you make the most cortisol at eight in the morning to wake you up, and then it goes lower and lower throughout the day and evening so you can sleep. If your cortisol is actually too high, so your awake hormone is turning you awake while you sleep the slightest urge to pee and you'll feel it. And you'll say, boy, you know, I feel like sometimes I get up once or twice. Sometimes when I'm lots going on in my life, I might be getting up five or six or seven times a night. That's somebody whose cortisol most likely is elevated, but their circadian rhythmicity is off. Hormones have a lot to do with keeping you in rhythm with the planet. There's a lot to do. Hormones are your metronome to the planet. and Poor sleep in perimenopause is not a predictor of poor sleep in postmenopause or premenopause. And none of the none of the pauses, the pre, peri, or post, are at all predictive of sleep issues at another time. There's a rare woman who couldn't sleep when she was younger and went into menopause, and now she can sleep great. But the majority of women, no matter how well they slept or didn't sleep, now tend to have issues. The more depressed you are, the more your risk of insomnia problems. But if you can't sleep well, who wouldn't be depressed? You could also have sleep apnea as you start gaining more weight, as we've already discussed, and you're sitting more. All of these tissues get really soft, and you can close off your airway and actually have hypoxic moments during the evening, which wake you up with a start. So how do we even take a look at some natural answers to all of this? Well, one of the first things is um, I designed the first Femline for Metagenics for doctors in the 1980s. It was five products and one of my very first products that I still get letters and emails about from people who wish that product was still on the market was called Fem Estro. And it was a product to deal with hot flashes and make you feel better going through menopause. One of the tricks I learned from formulating that product was the use of para-aminobenzoic acid, PABA, sometimes called vitamin BX. It's really an amino acid, but it's considered part of the B complex, but it's an amino acid that's actually part of the folate molecule. Um, PABA will help keep your hormones more zen. So if hot flashes are due to estrogen going up and down and up and down, and you are not a candidate at this time to take some hormone therapy, you can actually take 100 milligrams of PABA twice a day in the morning and evening. And I think Cal is the only company left that sells PABA, and it will help keep your blood levels more um, gentle and close to the same level and avoid the yo-yoing situation which can wake you up with hot flashes. Now, this was originally from the time when PABA was used. When cortisol came out, they discovered that PABA would slow the breakdown of cortisol. Then they discovered it would do this with thyroid, then with estrogen. And they used it a lot in patients that wanted to take less medication but get a more prolonged even effect. So I designed this product in one of the secret sauces was 100 um, milligrams of PABA twice a day. So that's something that you can do on your own. And whenever you take any kind, or even though it's an aspect of the folate molecule, it's good to take a backup B complex at another time of day. Whenever you take an isolated B vitamin, it's good to take a backup B complex. You can always take melatonin. Melatonin is not just a nocturnal hormone for sleep. It's not just a hormone for jet lag. It's one of the most powerful antioxidants in the body, but it really protects estrogen. It helps keep estrogen signals safe and balanced. And we're now learning in recent literature just in the last month or two that melatonin is very neuroprotective and giving large doses of melatonin to Parkinson's patients is looking to bring great improvement. So melatonin is going to protect your brain. It's going to be a powerful antioxidant. It's going to keep your estrogen more well-behaved. And in some people, it is the secret sauce to help you sleep. But the best thing to do is to get a non-oral non 
oral dissolve, just a regular melatonin tablet and chew it and let it dissolve. It doesn't really have much of any flavor under your tongue for 30 seconds. That's one of the secret ways of taking it. Most people for sleep don't take it in the more optimal way. Um, there's also ways if you have elevated cortisol at night where you can bring that cortisol level down, you can find out what the stressors are on the adrenal gland, but in a simplistic speaking, there's a number of herbs that actually help um, manage cortisol. So some of the products are called cortisol manager, and they're usually made with butcher's broom and magnolia blossom and um, ashwagandha, rhodiola. There's different herbs that help the adrenal glands um, not have such dig dysregulation of the cortisol. And there's nutrients that help with that too, but that, that gives you an idea. And sleep apnea, by the way, because uh, there I belong to a comedy club, and one of the funniest routines I've ever ever heard was when Dennis Tarden, oh my God, it was, I was screaming, shrieking of laughing, laughter. He said when he was young, he'd be really sexy and go to bed and have this great amorous time with his wife. Now he's going to share with you what he goes through before he goes to bed, being in his later 60s. And first he says, well, I can't sleep, so I've got my bottles of melatonin. And then my wife says, my skin is too dry, so I've got all my lotions and potions. And then my wife says, I snore, so I've got a strap around my jaw, and I've got the strap, and it's tied up at the top so there's a big bow on top of his head and then my wife I discovered I have heart disease and elevated lipids so I got tested for sleep apnea and lo and behold I have that so I've got this huge machine that I've got and he stood in front of us with all of this paraphernalia and I was sitting there thinking I mean that is the kiss of death event to libido a relationship to self-esteem but sleep apnea is very difficult on the body it creates and can potentially create insomnia, but it's one of the major causes of eye disease. Many of the major medical schools now, ophthalmology schools where someone's going to med school to become an eye doc, all have sleep study centers associated with them because most of damage to the eyes takes place while you sleep if you have poor sleep. So much of our life and our body and our waistline, the damage occurs while we sleep, so you want to have good sleep. Well, one of the easiest things to do is to get tested for hormones, and often if you go on a balanced hormone protocol, within two, three days, you're sleeping. I mean, you're just sleeping. So these are fixes that you can do if you still are one of the people who are hormonophobic, but hormone replacement in many people within a few days gets rid of your insomnia. Or you might need to tweak. Women need to tweak more than guys. Guys are pretty responsive to a protocol recommended by their docs. Women sometimes need to tweak and tweak, and it's a journey of getting you to where you're sleeping better. But lots of women, lots of women go on hormones and in a few days start sleeping really well. Um, one other thing to make a comment of sleep. I had found I'm a geek, and I looked at the literature, and I found an old-time study um, on something that really retrained the sleep brain deep architecture. And the reason I was searching that out was that there are some women that no matter what you do, you get their hormones together, you give them melatonin, or you also give them magnesium because magnesium can relax you at night. So, you know, 300 milligrams of elemental magnesium, and some people can't absorb their magnesium, so they do magnesium 3 and 8, which crosses the blood-brain barrier. 50 milligrams of that gets you more bang for your buck of magnesium in your brain. For some people who can't even absorb that, you can go on taurine, which helps your red blood cell accept the magnesium. These are some people have all these different recipes of these pills they have to take before they go to bed. <clears throat> some people, no matter what they do, surrounded by bottles, have a dental appliance for the sleep apnea instead of the big, big paraphernalia. They've done everything and they're still not sleeping. And I discovered this article on gabapentin, which is um, a drug for neurogenic uh, nerve root pain. But gabapentin has been shown to tamp down excessive cortisol while you sleep and retrain the sleep brain architecture. So I started recommending this to a number of patients and some people, not all, about five or six people out of 10 start sleeping that night that you give them. It's only the first night's 100 milligrams, the second night 200 milligrams, the third night 300. You really don't need to go above that. And most people get the benefit at 100. And what was interesting is that, that I started using this four or five years ago and now most of the sleep centers here in Austin their drug of choice to recommend to people to help them out are not hypnotics, but as gabapentin. It's being utilized by lots of sleep study centers for people who have 
serious sleep issues because it retrains the brain. You only have to be on it for about eight or nine months, and then you taper down in some specific ways. And so um, it's interesting that um, there's another study that came out just a month ago in sex hormones, chest medicine, and um, it's called Sleep in Women Across the Lifespan. And they said, Research is unraveling novel aspects of sleep pathology in women and the fundamental role that sex hormones play in influencing sleep regulation and the ability to not get aroused and possible outcomes of sleep um, condition. And what they find is that poor sleep quality and poor sleep deprivation create all kinds of health issues, but when you balance your hormones, hormones have a lot to do with stabilizing sleep. So why a woman, you know, we think of that study that came out of Texas um, by a pharmacist named Stephenson, and she took approximately 75 women, uh, she took two groups of 75 women, and they were all starting to go through menopause. And the major problems are your blood fats start to go up, your sleep starts to go south, you start to gain weight, your blood pressure starts to go up, you start to have this sequel of symptoms that you tend to go on the pharmaceutical conveyor belt because if you have sleep issues, you get a sleep hypnotic. If you've got blood pressure issues, you get a blood pressure med. If you have elevated blood fats, you go on a statin, yada, yada, yada. So half the women were tested for bioidentical hormones and given individualized, personalized replacement. And half the women were allowed to just go through menopause naturally, which some women say, if nature meant for me to have bioidentical hormones or any kind of hormones, I would have had them. So I'm going to just age naturally. So they had a group of women doing that and a group of women tested and treated and balanced with their hormones. So the women who were on the hormones didn't have the sleep issues, had stress in their life, just reported stress just like the other group had, but they could handle the stress better because you're going to learn the hormones have a lot to do with our perception of our life. They had better control of their blood fats. Their blood pressure wasn't going up. They didn't need to be on the conveyor belt of pharmaceuticals where the women who were going through menopause, the way nature just intended me to go through menopause, were now having a pharmaceutical cabinet filled with things that they needed to take to address each of the symptoms. Interestingly enough, there was a pilot randomized trial of the effects of mindfulness and relaxation training for insomnia on postmenopausal women. And that was published just two months ago in menopause, 2018 in May. And they took women who were not on hormone therapy and they did it for women not on hormone therapy because women on hormone therapy tend not to have insomnia. And they these are women who had a diagnosis of insomnia and or sleep apnea. And they put for eight weeks, one group into mindfulness meditation training, and the other group, they let them just be. And uh, the women who, within eight weeks, the women who had been in the mindfulness relaxation training had less insomnia, higher quality of life, and mindfulness did make an answer. So that's really good to know. So there's lots of things that can be done for sleep. That just gives you a little bit of an idea. Now, hot flashes, um, some of the Herbal answers for hot flashes. There's a study that came out in Gynecologic Endocrinology in 2013, and it was looking at all of the different papers because science evaluates things, and often there's a period where some studies say it's good and some studies say it's not so good, and you're thinking, oh my God, it's so confusing. I'm not sure I'm going to trust science anymore, but they look at the trend of the science. So, what these Um, researchers did is they took a look at lots of different studies that were published in the Coltrane collaboration surrounding black cohosh. And they basically said it is significantly beneficial, especially in hot flashes in lots of women. Now, the other things that are beneficial um, are, are foods or herbs that can signal estrogen receptor beta. Estrogen a hormone is a protein that speaks to proteins in the shape of a satellite dish, which is a receptor. So you have a hormone and a receptor. And estrogen's been on the earth longer than any other hormone delivering its signals for hundreds of thousands of years. So it has more receptors than any other hormone. 
And the first receptor was called ER alpha or ER1, and the second receptor is called ER beta or ER2. And it turns out that things that stimulate ER beta calm down hot flashes. Metagenics knew this well because they did a randomized controlled trial using um, um, rhubarb. Rhubarb is an herb that signals ER beta and calms down hot flashes. Soy is a isoflavone that is the major food isoflavone that signals estrogen receptor beta so that um, it calms down hot flashes. And the most significant study that found that soy could reduce hot flashes was in, with roasted soy nuts. So having a few tablespoons of roasted soy nuts a day signals a lot of ER beta signals, which calms down um, hot flashes. and. Um, What's interesting is there's another great side effect of taking soy because a lot of people are maligning soy. And this article came out in May in the British Medical Cancer Journal, 2018, and it's all about estrogen receptor beta. And they were looking at the estrogens alpha and beta or estrogen 1 and estrogen 2 in breast cancer. And what they discovered, which has really been known for a while, but this is another study yet to say, as many studies are saying, when estrogen receptor beta is signaled, you have less risk of getting cancer or the cancer you get is less life-threatening. So the results of the study indicate that estrogen receptor beta is a negative regulator of cell cycle and a possible tumor suppressor in breast cancer. Yanaki Gustafsson at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden discovered ER beta, and now he's been wooed over to Houston looking for drugs that are analogs of stimulators of ER beta because they protect against breast cancer. So soy is the major food that stimulates ER beta. So does rhubarb. So does pomegranate. Um, so does um, flaxseed, and so does psyllium. Uh, so, uh, psyllamarin, so, um, that's protected for your liver. So what's so interesting is Yanaki is one, he's looking for drugs to protect women by signaling ER beta, but two, he's publishing papers to show that milk thistle, that's what I meant to say, milk thistle and, um, and flax seeds together are excellent signalers of estrogen receptor beta, so they're very protective against breast cancer. So these are great foods to start adding in your diet, taking a milk thistle product every day and adding flax seeds in a variety of different ways throughout your week. That's why on my website, I have, if you join my community, I put together my favorite recipes that all my patients love that deliver you a lot of flax seeds, but they taste great because flax seeds have an interesting flavor and it's, it's culinarily challenging to make them taste really great, which these recipes do. Um, you can also use PABA for hot flashes because the whole idea of PABA is that it makes your hormones more even keel and some of the hot flashes occur with a lot of ups and downs. Now, what's interesting in the literature when I wrote Safe Hormones, Smart Women, women who have the worst hot flashes tend to live the longest. And there's a lot of different theories why I'm not going to go into all of it here. So don't worry. God doesn't hate you. Some of you that are having a lot of hot flashes will have lower risk of breast cancer and um, you'll live longer because you were a woman that uh, your body was fighting for your hormones longer. So now we're going to talk about fatigue. Fatigue is one of the other things that if you're sleeping less well, gaining weight and sitting more, you're really going to feel exhausted. One of the big reasons you start experiencing exhaustion is that your hormones are waning. And if you think of your body as having an internet system, and for you to have an energy debit, one cell has to send an email to another cell and you've got mail and that mail gives you energy or ATP in your Krebs cycle. So menopause, another way of looking at it, is your internet system starting to freeze up where you have less emails going to your cells and you're getting less ATP and energy. So one of the ways of getting more energy is getting tested treated and balanced for your hormones because hormones protect your energy. 
new understanding of estrogen. It promotes methylation. It promotes epigenetics. It allows your lifestyle to really imprint itself on, on the innards of your life, your outer life, and inner life to be more in sync. Estrogen does so many things that promote energy in so many different ways. It damage, Estrogen protects mitochondria from damage. and Your mitochondria are your energy packets and your energy organelles. So estrogen is protective of energy. So hormone replacement is one of the things to consider. Um, And I was just going to say some other thing about, oh, and the other um, thing that's very helpful with energy is to not eat junk food and processed foods and sugary foods. We know well that those drain you of energy. Having better sitting hygiene, so the estrogens you do have are working more, watching your physiologic back, working more for you than against you. But there's some other tricks. So for example, there's a number of double-blind randomized trials that show that magnesium potassium aspartate, so when magnesium potassium are riding piggyback on aspartic acid as a carrier salt, that is very promoting in some people, not everybody, of having better energy. Magnesium is a cofactor for about a thousand different enzymatic actions. And when your minerals and vitamins that are the green lights that allow activities biologically to go on inside of you are waning because you don't make great food choices or you're not digesting the food choices you're making, you can start being insufficient and then it's very hard to make energy in your energy kitchens. Um, you can have fatigue from less sleep, right? The, when you have really terrible sleep, it can catch up with you. Some people can get away with it and some people can't. You're also carrying more fat around. You have less mitochondrial boost. By the way, there are certain products that really boost mitochondria. But one of my favorite ones that you can just do by herbs is dried organic parsley. Dried organic parsley is very, very high in apigenin and another a number of other flavonoids and polyphenolic compounds that Boost your mitochondria. Boost, boost, boost your mitochondria. And of course, you can use PABA to even out your hormones. If you can't go on hormones, you don't want to go on hormones. You can try first taking PABA along with the other food suggestions that you're already starting to get. So some of the other problems um, are mood and perception. So I want to talk a little bit again about hormones. And this article came out in the Frontiers of Public Health, May of 2018, just uh, few weeks ago. And the name of this article sounds like that, you know, my last book was called Sexy Brain because it's all about how sex steroid hormones rule your brain. And when your hormones go south as you age, your brain then is going south or more at risk of going south. That's what this whole article is about. It sounded like they could have written a foreword for Sexy Brain. So they said, studies are showing that the sex hormones and their breakdown products, the metabolites, influence brain areas that regulate mood, behavior, cognitive capabilities, and this emphasizes the benefit of proper hormonal balance through all stages of life because hormones rule your central nervous system, and when they're out of balance, your central nervous system is out of balance, and when you got a woman in the house with a central nervous system out of balance, nobody's happy. They could have written the foreword for my book. So as your hormones are going south, you start having a perception of life that isn't the happy-go-lucky, positive, optimistic person you knew yourself to be. And it becomes more of a challenge to like what you're thinking, to keep liking yourself, especially that you're looking at someone new in the mirror who is yourself, and to really get things done because you start to think things that you want to do and lose track and become overwhelmed easily and can't get them done. These are all signs of waning hormone signals to your brain. This is all rebootable with hormone replacement, either through food or with hormones, but hormones work better than food itself, in my opinion, but not every single person in the world needs to go on hormone therapies. I'm not saying that. There's another article that came out um, two months ago in International Journal of Molecular Science, and it's talking about the emerging roles of estrogen-related receptors in the brain and how they influence brain health. 
And this is all about the action of estrogens on the brain. You know, the Cash County studies took a look at about 8,000 people who were all healthy and followed them into the future. So they called a perspective study. And they looked to see who got dementias, who got Alzheimer's, who got Lewy body disease, who got even neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinsonian disease, and who didn't. And what was going on in their life that might have been protective? And they discovered that if women had been on estrogen therapy for 10 years, that she had a 50% reduction of getting Alzheimer's disease. And in my book, Sexy Brain, I talk about if you even have the ApoE4 gene and there's ApoE3 and 4 genes that make you more vulnerable to getting Alzheimer's down the road, healthy levels of testosterone epigenetically don't allow those genes to express themselves. So hormones protect your brain, whether it is their signals or tamping down signals that would have put you more at risk of Alzheimer's. So in this paper, they say besides the known roles of estrogen in the reproductive system, they act in the brain to regulate a whole bunch of stuff. And um, in the past few years, we're learning more and more of what they do. And we've just discovered that estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta, and it's also in a lot of my talks, I discover the link is with oxytocin. They have numerous crosstalks between all of these receptors that help your behavior and your world life perceptions and your mood and your ability to not get depressed and to get that bullet list of all the things you want to get done done, those are part of you getting things done. So either using herbs that boost those signals or taking hormone replacement like bioidentical hormone replacement or even non, some women don't do bioidentical and even oxytocin replacement, these really improve your brain. We also know that dementias and cognitive decline can be type 3 diabetes where there's really disinsulinism. It's really a blood sugar issue. And we know the work of Bresidin, who's reversing in mild and moderate dementia patients, um, Alzheimer's disease. And part of the way he does it is to get them off all sugars and simple refined foods. And he uses also hormones. And then he gives herbs and nutrients that reboot mitochondria and energy. And he takes out things, bad things like lead or heavy metals that might be threatening minerals and brain health. So it's really a functional medicine picture. There's lots of things you can do, but hormones rule your brain. And the crosstalk between all the receptors in your brain make you a lot who you are and give you your, your soulfulness to keep your hippocampus going. And so you either want to do it through foods. And in testosterone, as you've just learned, um, even if you have the ApoE4 gene, it can tamp it down. If you hug your beloved at night, both lovers make more testosterone when they hug. If you work out in the gym and you get high interval bursts, you make more testosterone. If you supplement your body with magnesium and eat better foods, you make more testosterone. So it's not just a matter of tea replacement at a tea center. There are lifestyle things that you can do that can boost your own production, but that does wane as you get older and older to a certain degree, but not totally because there's some people when we do their blood tests have robust levels of hormones all throughout their life. So it's not set in stone. But Hormones rule a lot. So if you're getting through depression, if you're having anxiety, if you're having overwhelm, these are all symptoms of your hormone internet systems no longer delivering its email. And it's fixable without taking medication, which is now being linked to all of these different things. A lot of the medications for depression are anticholinergic and um, there's a lot of shadow sides to taking pharmaceuticals. So if you can address things naturally and avoid those shadow sides because life has enough to throw at you anyway, why wouldn't we do that? Now, there's also changes that occur in our gut. And in my new book that's not out yet, my new gut book, I talk about the unappreciated role of sex steroid hormones in the gut estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, oxytocin, hormones affect the gut because you've got receptors to receive signals from the hormones all throughout your entire gut. So an article came out a few years ago in Gender Me Medicine called Do Fluctuations in Ovarian Hormones Affect Gastrointestinal Symptoms in Women with Irritable Bowel? And they basically took a look at when women with IBS had pain and issues. 
And they discovered that women tended to have pain and issues when their estrogen levels were the lowest. So right when you're menstruating, your estrogen levels are the lowest or the, they're lower a little bit more in the second half of your period than in the first half. So that's when you have more discomfort, more pain, and more irritable bowel issues. So the article reviews that and comes to this conclusion that declining or low of varying hormones, especially estrogen, may underlie the occurrence or exacerbation of IBS, of pain, but that this might also be what's going on in menopause. And they, sum, they summarize, they say the increase in gut symptoms around the time of menses and early menopause occurs as sex steroid hormones get low, suggesting that estrogen and progesterone withdrawal really put the gut at risk. We know that women have less colon cancer when they're premenopausal, and as they make less estrogen, they have a higher risk. Just like they do with heart disease, they have more risk of colorectal cancer. So hormones protect your gut, and um, there's all kinds of things that you can do to protect your gut without hormones by eating a really great diet. Exercise also helps your gut because your gut is surrounded by a muscle. You can take digestive enzymes. If your digestive enzymes are going low, you can get a comprehensive stool test and rule out having things growing in you that shouldn't be growing in you. There's all kinds of things we can do today to really have a great gut. But just so you know, a really healthy gut contributes to healthy hormones, and you want to aim for two bowel movements a day because in the older 1950s literature by Cooper, they were discussing um, they, that there was more abnormal cells in the breast dependent on the colonic tr transit time. So the more you had tended toward constipation, there were more dysplastic or abnormal cells and healthy nipple cell aspirate where they just squeeze the breast and got some fluid out and look for healthy and not healthy cells. And whoever went to the bathroom twice a day never had any abnormal cells at all. And if you went to the bathroom once a day, you had a few abnormal cells. If you went to the bathroom a few times a week, you had a lot more abnormal cells. Why? Because you make estrogen, you get rid of it. You make it and you get rid of it. And the more you have a healthy to bowel movement a day, you don't have estrogen accumulate in a potentially adverse manner for your tissues. So your colon transit time, which has a lot to do with what you take, you know, eating some foods with fiber and fiber is, people are going keto and, and um, paleo and sometimes they're sacrificing how much fiber they get. In fact, some of the gastroenterologists are saying they're scoping patients who've been keto for a really long time. And because they're not getting any fiber, they're seeing inflammation and damage to the gut wall. So we need to cycle these diets. So we have periods where we get fiber in, or I have a recipe for gut balls that I'm going to publish somewhere at some point. That, that's really great. It's made of resistant starch. So I love raw organic banana flour or potato flour, which are really helpful to help you not have inflammation in your gut. And um, you can do digestive enzymes. There's so many things that you can do to help your gut today. Probiotics are just the, the tip of the iceberg and one of the things you can do, but there's many things you can do. Now, one of the other things um, is you can get real dry down in your vagina. You can have painful periods called dyspareunia. You can, your libido can, can go south. And that it can be fixed so quickly these days with localized creams. And the creams can be made of DHEA, which is uh, dehydroepiandrosterone. It could be made of the dab of testosterone there to give you a little bit more libido and sensation to the clitoris. It could be made of estrogen. Um, estriol with a little DHEA is a favorite combination of a lot of people because estriol is the anti-cancer forgotten protective estrogen that signals estrogen receptor beta. Or you can use oxytocin cream or gel, which has been shown to look like it has amazing estrogenic effects. You just euthanize that vaginal vault and make love making not painful at all and much more enjoyable, but it doesn't bind to the estrogen receptor, so it's safe for high-risk women. And there's people have batted about whether women should be on testosterone and whether it works for libido or not. I was giving a talk with a famous gastroenterologist, uh, not, not a gut doc, but a southerly doc, and he said, oh, testosterone doesn't have anything to do with, with libido. And that has not been my experience nor my patient's experience at all. And there was a study that just came out 
And this study came out a few days ago in menopause, the June issue, 2018, June 4th. And um, they took a look at all of the literature of menopause, of, of low libido, whoops, I lost my place here, low libido and... Um, let me just get this here. The name of the study was The Role of Androgens in the Treatment of Genital Urinary Syndrome of Menopause, GSM. And this affects over 50 women, and it could be all kinds of things where the tissues in the genital urinary system, which need testosterone and need estrogen, start to age because their emails are freezing. And this could be the clitoris, the vestibule, the minor and major uh, labia, the urethra, the vaginal wall, the pelvic floor, all of these start to get old and, and wobbly and not as responsive. And when you apply local hormone, hello, it wakes up. It helps pelvic floor issues along with other things that you can do. But man, given testosterone and a little bit of estrogen locally really helps um, minimize prolapse along with e um, exercise and healthy diet. But in this article here, they said, yes, it's true. We took a look. This is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health Experts Consensus. And they basically said after years of debate and debate and debate, um, you know, you can really use creams and male hormone creams work. And they talked about vaginal DHEA, which is a male hormone, or vaginal testosterone. And they all work to make lovemaking hurt less, make sex more enjoyable, make things less loose because male hormones give tone and stability. And that's what they do in the pelvic muscles. They, a lot of times, can stop some of the leaking along with magnesium. Um, it's not evolutionary smart to leak when you sneeze, but we seem to do that as we age. And so there's all kinds of things that can be done for these different issues that tend to take place because these tissues are dependent on hormones, especially estrogens, female and male hormones, androgens. So um, often when you start using a cream, the results are within a few days, if not a few hours. It's, it's extraordinary. So to not use these creams, I have women who come in that tell me that they don't make love anymore with their mate, their head looks down, they're so upset because their juice in their life isn't there, and they've been saying this to their gynecologist for the last year and a half, and I say, well, have you tried any vaginal cream? And they look at me, What? No, what's that? And nobody even mentioned it to them. I don't understand it. Anyway, um, here's another study uh, that came out a few months ago in Curious, uh, which is a very interesting name for a medical journal, Transdermal Testosterone and Female Hyposexual Desire Disorder. And this is a systematic review of all of the data. And they found, you know, we like to give enough testosterone so that your bones are stronger and your brain is stronger and all the other non-sexual things that it does. But this study found that if you reviewed all of the studies that have come up to recent times, it basically says testosterone helps reboot your libido. And they only use 300 micrograms per deciliter, a very, very small amount to achieve this. And they said it was helpful in the short term and in the long term. It wasn't just a quick fix. It was helpful in the long term. Now, there's other things that you can do for vaginal creams and gels. And I mean, that, that there's lots of different things to try, but hormones are very, very helpful. And I've had um, one husband and wife where they came in together. They were a really close couple, but the woman just didn't really, you know, it was too painful. Who wants to make love when it's painful? So I worked at a clinic at that time where we gave testosterone shots. So she got a testosterone shot, and by the time they drove home, when they were in the driveway, she was already ripping off his shirt. And these are the kind of patients that you get cases of champagne from at the holidays. <laughs> okay, so let's just talk for a little bit about hormone replacement, and then we're going to start wrapping this up here. I'm afraid to take a look at the time. 
um, as I don't have a list of the time on this recording program right here. So I don't want to take too much of your time, but there's so much to talk about. So, you know, to hormone or not to hormone, that is the Shakespearean and the bioidentican question. And um, I did shadow Dr. Kent Holtorf, who wrote one of the definitive papers on the safety of progesterone replacement. And um, he now has come out with a part one and part two that are really taking a look at the efficacy and the safety of hormones in, in the geriatric clinical practice. So part one is called Hormone Replacement Therapy in the Geriatric Patient, Current State of the Evidence and Questions for the Future. And it came out in 2011 and in a geriatric medical journal. And he basically says what they do is the scientific literature suggests that hormone replacement with estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and a lot of people start getting subclinical low thyroid symptoms, even though their blood work continues to look normal, has the potential to improve the quality of life and to prevent or reverse or reverse, listen to that, the use of hormones in people that are aging and having less hormonal emails has the potential to improve quality of life and to prevent or reverse the many symptoms and conditions associated with aging, including fatigue, depression, weight gain, frailty, osteoporosis, loss of libido, heart disease. These are all the things that we've been talking about because they happen to everybody. And number two came out a little a few months later. It's called Hormone Replacement Therapy, Current State of the Evidence. Um, and this is part two. And Kent was the third, Kent Holtorf was the third author on that study. So the data reviewed here and show that hormone replacement therapies improve some conditions associated with aging. Additionally, some of the long-held fears of significant side effects associated with hormone supplementation may be overstated, especially when providing patients with individualized care and optimal monitoring. Now remember the CEOs of the companies that made Premarin that are no longer in vogue and the, many of the synthetic patentable hormone replacement meds who bad-mouthed hormones and hormone replacement, especially right after the women's health initiative, but continue to do so, they went on and formed their own new company and are putting a bioidentical hormone. It's already gone through phase one and phase two. I'm not sure if they finished the phase three trial. And they've already been spinning off early papers stating it's now been shown that bioidentical hormones are safer than non-bioidentical hormones. These are the guys who are making the non-bioidentical hormones. The name of their product is called Replenish. I don't think it's on the market yet, but they're hastening to do it because the wave is to use hormones and balance hormones so that you do have a best health menopause. So, these three authors say, we encourage clinicians to consider such interventions using estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, growth hormone, what other hormones that patient needs to get those hormone emails and then the tissue response and the health improvement response. We encourage clinicians to consider such interventions based on the evidence presented. Um, and so... I remember I used to stand at the water fountain with Dr. Wiseman at the Wiseman Family Practice Clinic, and he practiced for over 50 years, and then he retired and moved to Costa Rica. Such a wonderful um, husband and wife team. So um, Dr. Wiseman would say at the water fountain, if you have 100 people in a room and everybody got the memo to eat better food and to work out more, but half of them were on hormone replacement. You would be able to cherry pick out who was on hormone replacement, individualized and monitored properly. And of course, you don't start on hormones without getting checked cardiovascularly. And if you've got a uterus, you need to have um, a vaginal ultrasound to have your endometrial stripe baseline. You need to do this right. You just don't need to order it online by yourself. But... Um, if you had a room of 100 people and everybody was living right and eating right, but 50% of those people were on hormones, you could tell. You could tell. They'd be standing taller, their skin be shinier, they're not searching for words, a train couldn't drive through their sentences. 
So hormone health is a big part of going through menopause with best health. Now, there's other things that I was going to talk more about bones and a few other things. Um, I'm going to just make a little comment on that. There's the Bone Scarborough Fair Diet where they took a look at what foods you eat and how well that protects your bones. And they found out that the more rainbow diet you eat, the healthier your bones. And in particular, foods that really, really protected bones were tomatoes, green beans, cucumber, broccoli, lettuce, prunes, and oranges. And the herbs that really protected bones were dill, sage, garlic, parsley, thyme, and rosemary. Just think of that song. Parsley, thyme, rosemary, and... No, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. If you think of that, you've kind of got the herbs that protect your bones. And um, you don't want to have too much calcium. In menopause, it's really important not to have too much calcium. We've been discovering in so many different trials that excess calcium causes more fractures then it protects bones. What you want is the array of multi-minerals that helps hold the calcium in its hydroxyapatite matrix. So getting on a good, most people that come in to see me aren't on a multi-mineral and multi-minerals that have really good levels of a variety of minerals are a very important way to go. That and exercise and not smoking and not drinking too much, um, all those bad things are bad for your bones and even bad emotions are bad for your bones. Your bones are living dynamic tissue and they're not just minerals. The uh, Minnesota Osteoporosis Clinic actually said that our brain on fire caused bones to um, disassemble, that, that your emotions have a lot to do just like minerals do. So we're really a body, mind, spirit, complex. So in summary, what are some really great things to just summarize this up? Um, Herbs work to help with symptoms, but they don't get at the root cause, which is hormonal imbalance. You can eat better foods and live better lifestyle, like more hugging causes more testosterone, but some people really need to have hormone replacement, and we're seeing hormone replacement as a more important option. Even the old CEOs that made um, the bad hormones that downplayed bioidentical hormones are trying to come out with their own bioidentical hormones. You can use PABA to keep your hormones more zen. There's herbs like black cohosh, maca, isoflavones, fish oil. Fish oils really help estrogens work better. The mineral boron really helps your body receive estrogen and work better. But some women make hormones and hyper rinse them out of their urine. Those are called hyper excretors. And that's a very special way of testing them and treating them. So there's all these caveats, of course, and I'm trying to simplify things for you. Uh, flax seeds are one of the best foods of, of um, menopause. Don't be afraid of soy as long as it's non-GMO and organic. Um, yams, be careful of some of the menopause products that are in yams. You can take them for a while, but some rodent studies with um, ingestion of long-term yam had an increase in a variety of cancers. I think it was bladder cancer. So I don't like people to be on long-term yam products. Um, There's all kinds of things that you can do uh, for your sleep hormones, magnesium, taurine, melatonin, but the hormones really, really help. And there's also this really, really fun um, product, this homeopathic product that if nothing else helps, some people love this little teeny white drops called Moon Drops by Highlands Homeopathic. The name of the drops are Moon Drops and they are um, a homeopathic that you suck under your tongue and help in some people, that's the winning thing to help them um, have achieve better sleep. If you have joint pain, hormones are very analgesic. They People on hormones tend to have less aches and pains and people who eat better. So if you combine a better diet and no gluten and much less dairy and you combine that with hormones, you've got a person who's aging with a lot less muscle pain. But another thing to really help with your muscle pain is a thousand milligrams of niacinamide three times a day. That will get rid of a leave. It'll get rid of Tylenol. It'll get rid of a lot of osteoarthritic pain. It's based on the work of Dr. Kaufman, a medical doctor who did research on thousands and thousands of patients with osteoarthritic arthralgias and myalgias, and he was able to reduce it significantly with the little old alkaline B vitamin niacinamide. So that's really a big winner um, along with your, uh, um, what is that product for the knees? Why am I not thinking of it? Glucosamine sulfate. Some people find a lot of benefit with glucosamine sulfate, but if you are a 
at high risk of glaucoma or you have glaucoma, you don't want to be on glucosamine sulfate for your joints when you're older because there's been some research in um, the journal, the American Ophthalmology Journal online that patients that take glucosamine can um, get elevation of their intraocular pressure that goes away when you go off the glucosamine. So niacinamide is definitively better for you. So this was a great long summary. I wanted to put everything down in one set place so that you could achieve the best menopause health. And don't forget to go to drlindsayberkson.com and sign up for that flax book so that you can get those recipes. And if you really like it, or not like you really love information like this, please go and give me a review so that we can pass this word on to lots of other people so they can have a best health menopause. Thank you so much and may the hormonal force be with you. Bye.